Oi, oi, and welcome to the Orient Outlook podcast, sponsored by Carol Angley Flores, with myself, Stephen Nussbaum. As always, I'm joined by my good friend, my South Stand chum, the bearded Lejande, the one and only, the daddy-o, it's Mr Paul Levy. Thank you very much indeed. Hello everyone, welcome back for this very, very, very special interview with our friend and former Orient player, Orient legend, Dean Cox. The non-disclosure agreement period has lapsed, the gloves are off, Dean is ready to give us the full expose on what was really going on at our club at the time that he left. We know it's been tough for some fans to hear about the dark times during Leighton Orient's history, us included, actually, uh, but to hear it from this player is why we've got to do this. But first, as always, we start with a word from our sponsor. Yeah, so the podcast is sponsored by Carol Langley Flores. They're based in Chinkford and have served by uh, Waltham Forest and the surrounding area for more than the last 70 years. They've got a fantastic team there, can do anything for you for birthdays, wedding events, family funeral tributes, anything you need them for, they can do. And they offer all O's fans and staff 15% off. That can be quite the saving. So to get in touch with John and his fantastic team, you can give the shop a call on 0208 529 4130. You can go and order via their website. They can be found at www.carolangley.co.uk. Or you can find the team on social media. They are on Instagram at Carol Langley Flores. They're on Twitter at Carol Langley E Floor. Or you can find the guys on Facebook at Carol Langley Flores. And I think we probably ought to say thank you to John for coming on last week's podcast. Superb yeah. guest, superb business. So if you need any flowers, go and order from Carol Langley Flores. So the main event of this very podcast is the one and only Mr. Dean Cox. Dean, welcome back to the Orient Outlook podcast. Thanks so much for giving up some of your uh, Sunday evening to, to do this with us. We appreciate that this is a story that a lot of people want to hear. So really compelled that, um, that, that we, we tell this and, and, and help you to, to do that. So first of all, how are you? What are you up to these days? What, what's going on with you? I'm good. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. It's been a long time. But, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good, yeah. Um, I'm... Uh, Itching to get back into football, um, whether that be in a, a managing capacity or, or coaching. Um, that's obviously my passion for football. And yeah, like, I, I did flirt the idea of going back playing, but um, yeah, I, I think I can safely say I, I won't be kicking a ball uh, ever again, which is quite a strange, strange thing to say. Mm. But um, yeah, looking looking to get back in uh, in a coaching capacity, like I say. And uh, just patiently waiting, I think it's, it's, it's tough. Um, obviously, I've had two jobs previously and um, sort of waiting for the manager of all merry go round, as they say. Um, so, yeah, patiently waiting, itching to get back. Um, but, yeah, I've been doing a bit of uh, coaching with local kids around my area. Um, so, yeah, just, just still ticking along with, with coaching and stuff. So, yeah, like I say, just waiting to, for the right opportunity to, to get back in. So let's keep it at the present day then for the time being, Dean. I think it's quite clear to see you've got a lot of love for the Orient and you still follow the Orient. What, what do you make of the Orient start to the season? I mean, as we sit here, we've played four league games, lost four, but have made decent progress in the Cowboy Cup. So, so what are your thoughts on the O start to the season? Yeah, I think obviously league form's not not great. I think obviously we're only four games in. I mean, I've watched a couple. Um, I just think uh, cutting edge as such, the real killer pass or a bit of magic from from an individual um, is, is obviously not there just yet. I mean, I, I wouldn't be too worried if it was me. I mean, it's only four games. There's a lot, a lot of games to go. But uh, obviously, you know, um, especially the home games, I think obviously the fans and, and, and I would be disappointed that, you know, that's your bread and butter and you want teams worried about coming to coming to your own home ground. So, yeah, I think they need, they, they certainly need to start picking up points uh, pretty quickly because, uh, obviously, you don't want that point gap sort of slowly getting higher and higher and staying in that sort of precarious position. So, yeah, I think just need to be sharper up top for me. Um, Sometimes, I mean, I do get worried uh, at times, crosses into the box. It looks... It's, <laughs> I think it's just, just maybe what I'm seeing. But, yeah, uh, everyone's opinion is different. I just think, certainly, like I said, crosses and, and, and things like that can 
be worked on. I think, yeah, a lot of the goals are quite easy goals. They're not having to work too hard to get them. So, yeah, yeah I think at both ends, uh, probably said it on your podcast before, but I think probably more ruthless in defending your own box and, and ruthless at the other end. When you get half a chance, you, you, you've got to take them. Yeah, I think that sums it up quite well. Thanks, mate. Um, when we last had you on, we had a two-part special back in November 2015. You were still at the club then. You'd just done your cruciate um, ligament. You were having rehab. I think you were having an operation a few days after yeah. we spoke to you. Um, but there were signs then that things weren't right. And we know that you'd signed a non-disclosure agreement once you'd left the club, which was on the 1st of September 2016. That meant that you haven't been able to speak to us up until now or to speak about it up until now. Is that right? And and you're 100% yeah, absolutely. just to check yeah, you're yeah, 100% yeah. clear of any restrictions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that is certainly the case. Um, yeah, so I sort of had to to keep quiet. I think uh, when you have to sign a disclosure, then I, I think you know that there's, there's some things that they obviously don't want people to hear. So I think that said it all... Um, but um, obviously, yeah, um, done my cruciate ligament. Um, obviously, I was out for, I think, about seven and a half to eight months rehab, you know, working tirelessly to, to get back. It was horrible watching games. I'm not a good watcher. Um, and I could hardly walk <laughs> for the first three months. Um, but I was still commuting, funnily enough. I'd done it, and I was commuting from Haven City to Chigwell. Amazing. So, with a crucial ligament injury, Mental. I was hopping onto a tube at London Bridge to bank and then the central line all the way along. So, it was challenging, I yeah. must admit. Um, it was very challenging. Probably the darkest sort of spell I had at the club, which, yeah, I, I just felt I missed out so much. And we started off quite well at the time. Um, so, yeah, it was, it's a long long, long time, and uh, obviously getting back fit, you know, working tirelessly. I remember we had a, a game uh, at home, I believe it was in the Cup, and it's the second game of the season, maybe fair, I'm not sure to be exact. All I remember is this, I was in the team and turning up at the grounds, walking into the change room, and my shirt wasn't even up. <laughs> so obviously I was thinking I don't know so obviously I've gone to Ada I said no you've got to put my kit up he's like oh no 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 he said uh, I was told you weren't in the squad he said I thought it was funny but I was thinking obviously thinking fucking hell what's going on? excuse my language sorry what's um, what's going on here um, so I remembered obviously at the time that Andy Hester Tyler was the manager and uh, obviously knocked on his door and just said hey, so what's, what's, what's going on you know um Shirt's not up. He said, oh, mate, he said, you're going to have to go upstairs. I said, what do you mean, go upstairs? He said, oh, um, Vito, his name. I don't know if you remember him, guys. But yeah. Vito was, you know who's number two, his ground worker that would be at the training ground most days. And you would liaise through him. His English was a hundred times better than you know who. I'm going to just call him you know who. That's yeah, that's yeah. fine. You know who, yeah. yeah. I don't want to give him the uh, satisfaction. Um, so, yeah, so obviously I went upstairs and uh, <coughs> spoke to Vito. Um, very to the point. Um, and just said, look, you know, we're, uh, we've accepted a bid from uh, Northampton. Uh, you can sign for him tomorrow. So, obviously, the transfer window was literally the next day. Um, so, I was like, I'm... I don't want to leave the football club. I've worked tirelessly to get back. Um, I love this club. I've been here for so long. Uh, I'm not willing to, to throw all that away because you've decided to, to get rid of me. Obviously, I had signed a new contract. Uh, whether or not it was the wage bill, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't on a lot uh, compared to a lot of the signings that come in on, you know, we're talking this huge money. Um, and this was all uh, upstairs to the ground and uh, he said oh, we, we'd like you to, to come in and, and speak to you know who so I was like okay well yeah I, I, I'm going to tell him exactly what I told you but if, if I need to tell him then that's absolutely fine 
So I walk into the boardroom and, you know, who's there? And uh, I think there was one, two, three, four. There was six others. Never seen them. Didn't know who they were. All around this round table. Um, and then something just struck me as it, I probably shouldn't be doing this on my own. Uh, to this day, I don't know why that comes to my head. So I literally said, look, I'm, I'm all up for talking, but I'm going to speak to my agent first. And if we are going to talk properly, then I'll, I want him present. Um, so they were fine with that. So I rang my agent and said, look, I'm, they're telling me I've been, uh, they've accepted the bid. And he's, he literally got the call just before I phoned him. He said, yeah, no, they, uh, they desperately want you out. Um, I've already answered for you that you don't want to go because I know, I know the answer. I said, that's actually fine. I said, they're all waiting to talk. I said, I need you here, really. Um, so I waited about 15 minutes and he obviously eventually turned up and um, sat down and, uh, you know, who just basically uh, off the script, the same as, as what Vito said. And I just said, look, uh, you obviously have your reasons. That's absolutely fine. I said, but I've dedicated a lot of time, a lot of, you know, love, sweat, tears, playing for this football club. I love playing here. I said, and I really, really do not want to go. Um, but then it was sort of to and fro, and then obviously I was sticking to what I was saying, and it was, it, it was clear that if I stayed, that I would be training with the youth team, uh, make a change somewhere else. Uh, not to attend any games, you know, no interaction, you know, stay away. Um, which obviously put me in a really, a really tough decision. Um, so obviously I had a couple of years left on my contract and um, obviously the, the negotiations then were, if you're not going, then we want you to just go rip up the contract. And obviously, I, I just had a, a child. I said, oh, I'm not in any position. I said, if, if, I was, if, if my family life and sort of was a bit different, I, I would be happy to do that. So I'm not, but at the, at the time, I needed a bit of financial security. Um, but the first offer was nothing. Nothing. So... Obviously, I was like, no, that's fine. I'm not accepting that. I'll be at training tomorrow. I uh, then made my way to Lane Station. I was heading home. I said, I'll see you training. I'm going. This isn't going anywhere. It's to and from. And, we, yeah, we just weren't getting anywhere. Um, so I uh, said, thanks very much. I said, but I'm, I'm not willing to do that. Um, so, like I say, yeah, I made my way to get the train. Uh, I got to London Bridge and got a call to come back. Uh, so then I went back, got back on the tube. Uh, my agent, luckily enough, was still around the facility, so I literally drove back. Um, uh, we spoke a little bit more, a little bit more was offered, but with two years, again, I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable with the way this was. It, 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 it was so rushed. There was, there was no, um, there was no heart feelings of, you know, consideration. You know, I've been, I, I've been at the club for, for sort of six years, and for it to end in such a calm, cool, calculated, uh, see you later, basically. There, you know, there was no sort of. Uh, not that I probably would have accepted it anyway, but if it was for financial reasons, if it was to balance the books, if it was something that I could maybe understand, um, but I was so perplexed that I, I couldn't get my head around it. And then it started making me pretty angry um, that it was dealt with in such a, yeah, like I say, brutal. Um, so I didn't accept anything at the grounds. I went home. Um, <coughs> and the transfer window, sorry, the transfer window was that evening. 
So I got a call at nine o'clock at home. There was another offer. I said no. Then obviously the transfer window closes at 11 o'clock. So during the process, I had given them a certain amount of months' money that I would like, um, which I stuck to. Um, and then obviously the difficulty then I had was it run over the transfer window deadline. So I was, there was no chance of me... Um, so, I mean, I hadn't spoke to another club. And obviously, my agent being my agent, he was sort of, during the day, also calling and saying, look, this is going to happen. You obviously need to be paying. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go anywhere. I said, I don't talk to anyone. I, I've got no interest in kicking a ball for any other football club in main room. I don't want to do it. So he left that. So we didn't, we didn't explore any other options. Um... And then obviously, like I say, the transfers are closed. So again, you're then in another predicament of an amount that you sort of agreed with the football club, but then obviously not being able to earn to the following January. So again, I was in a position where, well, I'll put the football club first. The whole time I was there, the whole time, you know, I gave everything I played through injuries. Uh, you know, I done everything I possibly could to bring success to the football club, and this, the way it ended, was was devastating for me. And I must admit, fellas, it's it's probably something I won't ever get over, if I'm honest. I can't to this day. I, you know, when you sort of sat with your own thoughts, having a cup of tea. You know, you're in the garden and it just pops your head. It's just like, how in the hell did this happen? Um, so, obviously then, like I said, the transfer window closed. So I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I've got a baby that's going to be born in a month's time. So I then called Vito and said, I know what we, uh, uh, I accepted earlier. That's off the table. I want this. So I asked it. I wanted more money. For my security, for my family. Um, some people might find it selfish or... But the position I was in was, you know, it was precarious. Even, didn't even know if, if I could get back in the league. Wasn't, you know, it was a, a devastation of... You know, I wanted to finish my career at Leighton Orient. There's, I couldn't be in any clearer. I remember saying it to Barry Earn, I said it to you know who. I you know, I've got no interest in playing anywhere else. I just want to play here, enjoy my football. Um so in the end, uh what I went back with was then accepted. Um and I'll always remember the um well my last my last train train journey as a a late night player, so I obviously had to go in and sign the forms um, at the ground. Uh, you know who wasn't even there. There was no thanks for everything. Or I turned up and, of course, Abe was there. You know, the, probably the heartbeat of the football club, along with Lindsay, fantastic people. Um, and I just took a... I must have stayed there for a good couple of hours. I saw the paper. I was just walking around the pitch, crying. You know, I'm not ashamed to say it. It was, you know, for me, it was, it was big. It was really a big moment in my career, as such as the downfall. You know, from then on, I didn't really continue the heights that I, I did at, at Leighton Orient, and. The main reason of, of just one, my injury, just come back. You know, I was training day and afternoon, running in the gym, watching training. Couldn't wait to get back, desperate to get back. 
And then when I did come back, obviously I, I played or I scored. I, I, I wasn't even fit, if I'm being honest, boys. It was just me badgering the manager, saying, listen, it's, it, it's solid enough. I got it all clear from the docks. And, and obviously they were hesitant in, uh, as such. Um, but, you know, obviously you haven't had many minutes. I said, don't worry about the minutes. Just get me out there. I, I am not, I cannot watch another game. My leg's fine. I'm not in any pain. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to let the lads down. I said, the adrenaline will get me through. Um, and yeah, and then, like I said, as I've gone through, to turn up and for that event to happen the way it did, cold, calculated, yeah, it, like I said, it's, it's scarred me a little. You know, it's, it's tough to to even talk to you about it, to be honest. You know, I haven't, you know, I have thoughts, but to actually speak out loud, it, it, mm. it makes it sound even worse. Um, and like I said, when, when you know, first come in, the optimism was high. It was, you know, we've got an investor that wants to invest, obviously board in players, and, you know, the rumours of wages, yeah, they were huge. Absolutely huge. And I think, and it's no disrespect to the players at all. If you're offered it, you're going to take it. You know, and the players themselves, absolutely great lads. Um, but I think that was probably the first cog that started off, you know, you know, listen, people talk, the, the lads aren't stupid and he's getting paid this. And I just think it brought unnecessary um, rifts as such that, or mistreatment, why is he getting this? I should be getting that. Like I said, I think with the squad we had, two or three players, this and that, of course you have to, you, you're investing and I just think that you know who just paid over the odds. You know, they obviously had no real um, experience and it was easy to sort of do it and just chuck money at it where I felt that it could be a bit more calculated and I might have read the question which I'll answer now is did anyone try and stop yeah to try and stop him when I met him at his house in the Mayfair I just uh, and I don't know why you know what I'm like I just obviously it's, you can see it in the dressing room right you know you're sitting there and people aren't saying the same sort of um uh, camaraderie that we had under Russell was dispersing right in front of us. And he was not contactable as such. He wasn't around much. And when he did turn up the training ground, he knew there was a problem. So that was never really the right time to, to have a conversation. So I just rang him and said, look, I want to help, but what you're doing at the moment, it, it, you know, we're, we're on a slippery slope. I've been here for many years. Let me try and advise you, direct you into helping the football club. At the moment, you know, certain things that have been done and said, and it, it, it's not going down well. Do you so think that put help. a target on your back then, Dean? Sorry to interrupt your flow there, because no, it's no, absolutely... Do you think that then put... Perhaps, I think maybe uh, I'm the one that's questioning him, you know? Yeah, exactly, think, challenging him. Yeah, I think... But, it, and it's like I said to, to you know who, he was, listen, I'm not telling you what to do. You will go and do what you want to do. You'll pay your money, which I totally respect. You want to do it. You, you do what you feel is right, but I'm just offering you a bit of inside help. I'm in the dressing room. I'm around the players. I'm around the manager. I, you know, there's a lot more to than just oh, I've got money. Let's go and buy him, 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 and give him this, this, and this. But you've got to see the the, the effect of the decisions you make on other players. You know, it's the players you brought in, it's not the whole team, it's not squad. Squad wins your things. 
you know, individual winning matches, but squads, we, you know, they they get to they get to League One playoff finals with a tight knit squad where the camaraderie is high. You know, that's half the battle, keeping everyone happy. That is half the battle. And I think, yeah, like I said, so I met him. Um, you know, uh, like I said, I, uh, I contacted him, picked up the phone, and was polite. You know, I could never say he was rude, you know, and said, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to listen. So we arranged for me. Uh, again, obviously, I, I, I took my age and it's just for um, probably a bit of a bit of backup, I suppose. Because um, obviously, I, uh, around, uh, for training ground, you see all different sort. There was a lot of people that would just turn up and it was... You know, it's, it's just, yeah, yeah, it's just, for me, it's just so frustrating. We have we have created such a talented squad. I, I can't get my head round, like I said. So obviously, like, I met him and, you know, he, he sort of said to me, you know, well, what do you think I could do? And, you know, basically what I just said to you, I, I said, stop throwing your money big money, I said, listen, you can still get good League One players on half the amount that you are paying. I said, you're just chucking your money away. I'm trying to help him. You know, I just, you know, and, and I've mentioned certain players. Oh, I don't know about him. Oh, well, I'm telling you, he, you, you could go and get him. I said, I could get him for you. I'd get it, I'll do it for you if you want me to do it, you know. It's, it's you know, just offering my services because... What I didn't want to happen, happened. You could see it. It was unfolding in front of my eyes. It was, it's, and in, being in that position was, was horrible. You know, it's horrible. Um, and yeah, so obviously uh, a lot of what I said was, was not listened to. Um, the game, which is, it, it's his prerogative, that's absolutely fine, but. I think for myself, if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't done that, then I probably wouldn't be able to live with myself. It's one of those. And I was thinking about it for a while. And then when I'd done it, I wish I'd done it so much earlier. It's one of those situations. Um, and yeah, just not that everything I was saying would, would have gone right, but. I was trying to, I was trying to help him, but also the football club. If you get what I mean, mm -hmm. it's very hard to be so diplomatic, and you know, I, I really wanted to say a lot of things under the sun, like what you know, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> but I approached it man to man. This is what I would do, but. Like I say, it was it was it was listened to. Like, like I said, I, he, he opened the door to me. He didn't have to do that. Um, he listened, um, but again, it's his. Like I say, it's because if he wanted to act on that, or you know, after that conversation, you know, those sort of meetings never happened again. So it kind of fell on deaf ears, then, right? So you told him your views, and nothing happened, <laughs> and you yeah. never got the chance to speak to him again. Yeah, I, I felt that I'd done it, and obviously I was still playing, and I was seeing, sort of seeing what he was doing. I'm thinking, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's not listening. It's, yeah. it's his way. We, listen again, we, you know, you see it all the time, and like I say, it, 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 it was his money and his, his club at, uh, as such at the time. Um, but yeah, it was difficult. But I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that. I at least um, spoke for the fans as such, you know, because the fans aren't stupid. They're not stupid. And I think he felt that, and, and the way he acted, that he felt that what he was doing was okay. But, I mean, come on. It's, you know, it's so frustrating, guys, at times. And to bite your tongue for one, 
you know, it was, you know, it really, it really was just a bit of a, a manic, crazy time. Um, and obviously, when you first took over, you, you'd expect a period of, of of getting the feet under the table and getting used to it. But obviously, we all know that it obviously spiralled into into something that we all didn't want. You know, we didn't want it. Like I said, one one penalty kick away mm. from the championship to to then go on to to sort of what happened was was devastating, devastating. You know, to be part of such a high for it then to come to a, a pretty much an all time low in such a quick time scale was yeah heartbreaking. Well, it felt like. You know, you mentioned camaraderie and Russell Slade obviously built that squad and that team and I think within six or seven games Russell Slade had been kind of relieved of his duties. It seemed like he was a, already had the target on his head. Obviously you were very close to Russ and, and that relationship had been very well documented, the close relationship you had with Slade. I mean what what were you feeling when I guess Russ is giving his marching orders and then suddenly you've got an Italian well, di- uh, director of football yeah, I mean, who's like, now I managing? I knew it's on the cards because um he told me to meet him, so we obviously he got relieved after Knox County. But on the Thursday, I think he he wasn't told, but he was he certainly had a conversation where he felt that his time was up. Um, so yeah, he asked for me. So I, of course I did. You know, I went and met him, and he was devastated. He was devastated, and and for me. It was, it was big. It was big. It, I mean, it, it sounds really, really dramatic, but when he went, it's like losing a dad. Not a football manager. Not a football manager. Um, mm. Off the pitch. For me, personally, what he done for me was above and beyond. Um, and yeah, so I had that conversation at that time was... Uh, was a difficult one. It really was, and you know, he sort of said that you've got to stay in. We've, we've built such a good squad; you'll be fine. Um, you know, you've got the fan base. You've earned the respect of the fans. He said, "Don't worry about me." And um, and it's hard to, you know, it's hard to see uh, a bloke that you respect. You know, when I speak to him now, I still call him Gaffer. I don't, mm-hmm. I can't. You know, he always corrects me and says, Cox, just, just call me Russell. <laughs> so I just, I just can't. I just call him Gaffer, so he's, he's, he's got to live with that one. But, yeah, tough conversation on the Thursday. Mm. Um, but, obviously, we trained Friday. Professional as always. We were, nothing would change. But, he never said it, but I could tell by his demeanour. I, I knew he was going. Whether or not he was told after our conversation or Friday after training, but I, I could tell. And I never, do you know what? I never questioned him on it. And sometimes I, I wish I did, but I didn't. I, I saw, I could just see, I mean, you, you both know Russ really well, you know, the, one of the funniest men, men I've, I've probably met. He's life of the party, you know. One of his best strengths was obviously man management, and you know the players loved him, absolutely idolised him. And when he's not as chirpy and joking, and you know something's up, you just know something is up. And I remember him walking back into his office and uh, at Chigwell. I don't know if he's been there, but obviously the main canteen is a door into the office. And I always remember I was sitting there opposite and I was eating my, eating my lunch. And uh, I just finished, I put it up and uh, I went, I'll see you later, Gaffer. And he turned around and went, see you later, son. <laughs> but I could tell the look, the look, the look he gave me was, I'm done, mate. And I remember I really, and I probably should have, gone into the office to check if it was all right. But I didn't. I didn't want to believe it. But obviously, yeah, like, we we had Notts Notts County and, uh, yeah, it was obviously 
relieved of his duties and yeah, it's a it's a tough pill to swallow. Um, although knowing that it was probably going to happen, I still think you know we've I saw him yesterday. We travelled up on the coach. It's, it doesn't feel real until it happens. Mm. And uh, yeah. I mean, we, we often speak about it. Um, and I think similar to Russ, he'll, he'll probably admit it. You know, I said about after leaving Leighton or that my playing sort of career from that went down. And I think, you know, Russell's, Russell's went on a similar path, probably lasted more longer, but at it, it, such a, a higher level, but certainly dropped down and, um, yeah, I think it, it, it took a bit out of him too. So, yeah, very tough. And after that, for me, it was, it was you know, what's going to happen next, you know. Mm. In in terms of what happened, um, from a chronological perspective, you've come back from your uh, cruciate ligament injury throughout the summer of 2016, ready to start the 16-17 the season. Um, fresh, ready to go. You get pulled upstairs. You have the chat, and the next thing you know, the transfer window shut, and you're you're done. You're out the door. So, unfortunately, so to speak. Um, yeah. Why weren't you then allowed to play for another club until the next transfer window? And why didn't you then sign for another club? Because you then signed for Crawley the following year. Can you just just a couple of questions? I've got. Gaps in yeah, kind of okay, I think, yeah. So once once the transfer window closes, um, then your registration can then not be registered anywhere else. It's quite simple. That is that that is the time frame. Um, so you signed outside the transfer window. Then you agreed it once it had been shut. Then yes, yeah. Okay. So sorry, yeah. So it was like I said, we missed the transfer window uh, okay. closing. So we hadn't agreed, and then yeah. So once that had closed, that is when I said, "Look, I'm in a precarious position. I know what we've we've, we've sort of discussed and and actually uh, agreed on." But I went back with something else on top. I said because I'm not going to be able to go in there, and I'm not. I can't play anyway. Mm. Um, so then that was agreed the following morning, and then I went to the ground the following afternoon, and that's what I mean by it's so quick. Gotcha. Uh, and, and, and obviously my biggest frustration is why could it not just have been done before 11 o'clock? We had started talking at 6 o'clock at the ground. We had ample time. Ample. Ample time. Mm. We had four hours in front of each other. I was there. That's the biggest thing for me. I, I think... Listen, don't get me wrong, I, I still would have been devastated to leave because I didn't want to leave. But I think the devastation probably could have been halved slightly with, you know, really it should have been done within an hour. You know, I don't see why we come to common ground quite quickly. Um, and then I could have, you know, tried, tried to fix myself up at obviously a league club to, to continue my career at the highest level I could possibly do. Um, but obviously, yeah, that, that, that wasn't to be. Um, which, of course, is, for me personally, was, was another sort of um, extra bit of devastation was, you know, what, what the hell am I going to do? You know, I was left sort of in limbo of of what to do. You know, I obviously signs uh, the agreement to leave, and then obviously getting the train home. It's sort of like, well, I told my agent not to not to read. You know, like, there's there's nothing in the pipeline. I've got a baby coming. What the hell am I doing? You know, that, that's the realization of. You know, I haven't got a job. How am I paying my bills? How am I going to bring out my child? You know, uh, hence why, you know, 
and, and, and like I said, people might think it's selfish, but I, I did ask for more money. Mm. But for security for my family... That's not a know, problem. I, That's never a problem. Or particularly you know, with those I, people. I, yeah, I, 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 get, I, get, yeah I, think, I just think you, know, you can see it in both ways, which, you know, listen, on other circumstances, I, I, I wouldn't have taken any money out of the football club. The, the football club gave me uh, everything. You know, it, 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 it got my career back on track. It got me a place where I felt I belonged. It got me to a place where I played the best football I could possibly dream of and experienced some of the best nights of my life. Um, but just a sour taste with just a little bit with, with, with the way it ended, mm. uh, which obviously, yeah, I can't change now, unfortunately, but... Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was sad. And the alternative to, to leaving would have been to have stayed. Would have been to have stayed, but you'd have been training with, possibly on your own or with the youth, but not been allowed to come to any games. So they would have really kind of ostracised you and sort of kept you well out of the, the dressing room and away from everybody and else. I, and I just felt that wasn't that wasn't good for anyone, like, you know, and yeah. you know, the attention that would have brought on. On the team, I, I, I just felt by doing that, I'd be, I would be being selfish by sticking around. I felt it was best that the problem was nipped in the bud, if I'm honest. Um, and I just didn't. Feel, what, what use would it have been me going there to, to train the youth? Yeah, listen, I, I, I could have done that, and you know, I, I know some players throughout their careers have, have certainly gone through a stage where they've done that. Um, but like I said, I just I felt it would create too much of a to- toxic atmosphere, you know, with with my rapport with the fans, and you know, the whole time I was there, they they stuck through me thick and thin, um, and you know that that possibly could have turned into a really really toxic situation. Um, which I would have appreciated because, you know, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go, but you're sitting there, you're at home, this is his 34 weeks pregnant and I'm, uh, am I going to go in, you know, in a selfish point of view in terms of football? Yes, I'll be training, but for what? There'd be no reason for it, you know. And like I said, I think, once obviously everything had been said and I, it was very clear that that's going to happen that you know I had a decision to make and you know as hard as I mean it's the hardest words that you know I ever said to me so I was yeah okay I'll sign it but I don't want it is what I said to him my exact words I'll sign it but I, I, I really don't want it Dean you, um, Dean you obviously signed like an NDA I, I guess that's quite unheard of in the football world. I'm not too aware of too many players no. signing. And so, what were they afraid? I get. I guess. Why were you made to sign well, one? I think, I think, well, I think you know, I, I, with the conversations we had had, and you know, the way he had acted throughout his time, there was certainly a lot of things that he obviously was worried about coming out. Um, it wasn't worded like that. It was. It was put in front of me to say that. What's happened here is, is between us, and I remember I remember saying to him, "I said, so are you worried if people hear about it?" And he, he just looked at me and went, "Yeah." And that was it. I said, "Yeah, give it to me. I'll sign it." Um, so yeah, I, 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 I can only assume that he obviously didn't want certain things. Um, coming out. I mean, I remember the time on social media and a, a lot of what the fans were saying, whoever was finding out these things, quite a lot of that was true. So, so Dean, Dean, when, Dean, when you say that, obviously, I mean, there's been ample speculation, obviously, about he who shan't be named picking the team, rocking up and, you know, making selections and you've already mentioned that's him true. being at the training ground. So, I, so, yeah, so I, yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Yeah, that, that was well. That was the big one. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. What in terms uh, of picking? In terms of picking the lineup? Yeah. So he turned up on a Friday. 
we were doing Team Shape. I was in the team. I can't remember the other. Come across with a piece of paper, gave it to Hess, and the lineup has changed. And that's what we went with on the Saturday. Wow. <laughs> Brilliant. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely true, that one. Yeah. Um, not, not as many times as people think, but certainly on a few occasions. Or what? Happens, yeah. Or were there times then where you think he he said to Hess like, or any any manager that he had? Oh, I, that, I mean, Hess didn't have to say. You know, it, it give a it give a sort of pep talk on uh, a Friday, and you could tell that that weren't his team. There's no way, you know, to a point where people are looking at each other thinking, "This is a joke." You know, obviously Hess is the manager. That's put a brave face on it. You know, what do you do? Hmm. What do you do? So he wasn't was, he wasn't interacting with any players. He was literally simple as passing a note to the to the manager at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then on, on, on countless occasions, he's he certainly had a conversation because things had changed. That obviously Hess has obviously been spoke to direct. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was yeah. It was I can't. I mean, when something like that happens. It's it's obviously shock first, you know, what is going on, but once that happens, then you're just waiting for the next big thing to happen. Then you've got players thinking what's going on. So once you've got players thinking what's going on, you then you've got a manager that's got to manage that, you've got a manager that's got to manage you know who. And you could see the stress on this. You could see it. It was it's, such a weight on his shoulders. You know, just... And I always remember thinking, like, what would I do? Not a clue. It was impossible. It was, uh, it was just such a... And like I said, it was such a strange feeling. From what we'd been at, what we had achieved, where we were as a club, the foundations, the team, uh, a cracking academy... You know, things were were on the up. And for, for, for these things to be happening, you know, the following season was was crazy. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> you know, I laugh, but it, it, it's not funny. It's not. It's just... A lot of it just blew my mind. In, ter- in, ter- in terms of that season, Dean, obviously Fabio Liverani turned up and it was his first job and I think fair play to Liverani who's gone on to have a fairly decent career in Italy. But obviously there were rumours at the time as well of Liverani making kind of these impassioned half-time speeches and I think it was Milanese literally just saying two words to you. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Milanese, yeah, short and sweet. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. Two different kinds. I mean, again, it was. I feel sorry for the the managers that come in. I, I don't lay any blame as such. They wanted the job; they were offered it, you know. And, and the powers that be have, have authorised that and wanted that. Obviously, the language barrier was 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 massive. Yeah. You know. It, talking in Italian and then you've got a translator. I mean, yes, of course you understand what's that, but there's no, there's no passion with it. It's just read out to you, monotone. You know, it just... Yeah, I'm... You know, when you come from us, where we're so passionate and... Uh, you know, and there was a point to it, every sort of team talk that we'd have. And however... You know, don't get me wrong, when when they were speaking in Italian, yeah, that they, they sounded passionate, but we didn't have a clue what they were saying. So then, like I said, once it was translated, that, that, that split second of waiting, and then obviously every team talk that happened, it was like, oh, God, here we go again. You know, it's, I don't think that helped. I, I, I seriously think if he could speak a lot more better English, it would have been a lot better. It would have been a lot better because you not 
we would understand him, of course, and we did, obviously, after it being translated, but we would feel the passion. You know, you had no sense of feeling of what was being said to you. You know, there's no... Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to explain. Just Russell, you just... By the time he finished, you're ready, you're ready to go, you know. And, and he'd always sort of say, you know, we're going to war. We ain't leaving this pitch. Nobody's taking them out of us on our own. You know, certain things that would obviously fire you up. You know, but like I said, by the time you're, you're ready to go and win a game. Whereas on the flip side of that, with, with Liberani and Malaysia, he was, at the end of it, it, was, it just felt like a normal conversation. It wasn't a team talk. Um, but yeah, and obviously, yeah, we, as players, he, he, when a manager comes in, he, he can't change the manager. You've got, to, you've got to try and work with him. Um, and the best way I, I I dealt with all the managers that we had was think of the fans, think of the punters that pay their money. They work Monday to Friday, nine to five, to come and watch you play football. There's no excuses. They're coming to watch you play football. And however however bad it got, and it did, it got bad. However bad it got, you'd wake up, look yourself in the mirror, and just try your best for them. And that's the, the, the only way I could function as such um, to keep going because it was tough really tough Dean can I ask you about the um, I don't know if my timelines are correct but obviously there was the reality TV show that took place were you still at the club when that reality TV show was happening and if so kind of how were you feeling about that and the squad well it was a joke <laughs> well it was an absolute yeah, it was, it, uh, yeah, 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 I was there. Uh, I, I, yeah, like I said, I just little things have happened in that, and it, you you just knew, didn't you? Oh shit, this is this is gonna this is gonna end bad. <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, I'm like, I don't really beat around the bush. I just it was. I mean, it's just laughable, isn't it? Mm. What other football company name has done that? None. Because it's not the done thing. It's just not. And that's where, again, when I I said to him, you're not helping yourself by doing these things. It's a football club. The punters want to see you run this football club the best way you can. Be inventive. Interact. That was a big one. Interact. I said to him, once a month, why don't you put out a, a chairman's notes? Talk to them. Explain to them what you want to achieve. Excite them. Like I said, they work so hard and they want to come and watch their team. They want to pick up that programme and be reading something that you've got planned. Excite, you know, some exciting news. Not doing things like you just said. Not putting them on the back foot. Now, there's another thing I said. A lot of the things you're doing, you're upsetting people. I said, and it's only going to be so long that these people are going to put up with it. I guess my last question on, on he who shan't be named is obviously you won at the club by the time he sold... The club. So, I guess, what were your feelings on the day when he walks away and the new board coming? Because as a fan, we felt elation, and I can still remember kind of that deal happening and feeling so. Do you want to really know? I probably should have trained with the reserves, and I probably still would have been. I'm sure I would have been in the last year, and I may have reignited my my career mm-hmm. at late night. Uh, obviously, for the football club, it was. I mean, obviously, when I've been a gone, of course, I was, I 
when I, like I said, I'm not. When I went to Crawley, I wasn't the same. It just wasn't. It didn't feel right. Uh, it's hard to. It's hard to um, put into words, but I'd walk, walked out on that same pitch for so long. And I remember my debut at Crawley. I, I walked out and just. It just didn't feel right. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't really, I did okay. Should I have done better? Definitely. But my headspace, it was, like I said, especially at that time because it's so raw, it was, yeah, difficult. But from afar, I was delighted, of course, because it was only going that way and it was only a matter of time. Um... Could he have gone a little bit earlier? That would have been great. <laughs> I possibly could, st- could have still been there, but yeah. that's not the way it panned out. So, but for the football club, fantastic. And what they've done for that football club has been nothing short of a miracle. Fantastic. And they deserve a lot of credit. Yeah. Um, great guys. I've met them and I've come down. Passionate. That's what I like about them. They're a bit of me because heart on sleeve and want to do well. And under their stewardship, they've been fantastic. And I'm sure that, that they will go from strength to strength. We hope so. We <laughs> hope so. Dean, I know I said that was the last question. I've got one more for you on that. I think in that 13, 14 squad, I think you had a few kind of older boys who were pretty much coming to the end of their careers and a few who were in their prime. I would say you at that point were in your prime in terms of your age yeah. and then you yeah, signed yeah. a three-year deal. I mean, do you feel bitter about it all considering I would say that you've kind of had your best years ahead of you or about to hit and those were, I guess, taken away from you to a certain extent? Well, it's a no. I've, I've learned to live with it. But, um, yeah, like I said, certainly it derailed me and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say it did derail me not me for six and yeah, to rediscover that form and, and consistency was was hard to come by. You know, I'd have sort of good spells, but you know, when I was at Lady it was it was consistent, um, and it was hard. It was really hard to um, sort of everything was different, and I was so used to the same things and the same faces and. You know, I was, I was sort of creating my own sort of legacy, really, at Lady St. Norton, and I didn't want to go. I think that's the worst bit. I think a lot of players, you know, sometimes get to a point where um, they feel that it's time to move, but I never felt that at Lady Norton. Like I said, I, I was more than happy to finish my, my career there. Um, for that not to happen, I, 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 I'm not bitter, I'm sad. I'm sad because I could have had a lot more fulfilment of my career there than when I moved on. And that's no disrespect to the clubs I went to. Cool, it's a fantastic club. I also went to Worth in East Mumbara. Uh Great football clubs. But this was my football club. I didn't want to go. And I was forced pretty much with an automaton um, and yeah sad that money couldn't be resolved you know I, I I said to him if it was about money hold my wages take it off me I want to stay take it you know there was obviously options thrown and you know I was like well, if it is about money then just half my weekly wage take it I want to stay you know, I gave every opportunity, which I'm so glad I did. There's no looking back and thinking, oh, what if? I should have done that. I ticked every box. I couldn't have done any more. It was clear. They just wanted me out of the building. So I, I think when that happens, like I said, they're, they're, there was only one way it was going. And, uh, yeah, sad. Very sad. But... Um, the good times certainly take over you know who. I, I always think of the good times and the goals. 
celebrations and uh, going to Wembley, playing Arsenal. There's so much more better memories that I can I can take with me. So sad when I speak on specifics, but um, yeah. We did have a good ride. I did, have, I did enjoy it a lot. We had a great time. We, had, we, we spoke about your goals at the time when we interviewed you back in 2015. So anybody that wants to to hear about that at the time, we won't sort of regurgitate that that now because that, that, that's that been well covered. But we did get one tweet in from Lewis, uh, from Lou Tweed 10 who said, ask him if he remembers the free kick away at Northampton and then knee sliding into my arms. Absolute scenes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That was a nice free kick. It was right there, last minute of the game. I remember putting it down, just just hit the target. Um, and then, yeah, once it flew in, I just I ran off a bit, a bit like a madman, and uh, celebrated with the Rays fans. And yeah, I do remember. I do remember it. Yeah, yeah. Um, a great feeling. Yeah, that was in the Black Rain. I'm still sure. I remember that. I remember seeing those photos. I'm sure we can dig that one out um, of the archives. Kevin Cowlin said, Give Dino my best wishes for the future and a big thank you for so many memorable moments. He said he would write a book on his family, 10, and all that went on. And are there any plans now to do this? And if so, when? Uh, yeah, I would like to. I would like to. Um, I think it would be a good story for people if they uh, were interested in me still obviously I know I've, um, I've sort of left the football club for many years but yeah it'd be great to, to sort of go from the start and all the way through because um, uh, yeah it was a hell of a ride like I said lots of ups obviously a little blip if you know who but a lot of a lot of happy memories that I've I've lived and yeah I I think people would would like to read. So in the near future, I think I think that's something I, I certainly really would like to do. So mm. yeah, I will obviously communicate that with with the fans on on social media. But um, yeah, I would like to do that for sure. Awesome. One one of the part of your answer you just gave there it segues nicely into Paul Stain's eighty sixes tweet, who said, "Everyone knows how much Dean loves the club." And was there ever a conversation with our current owners about the possibility of coming back after you know who had sold up? No, 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 there wasn't. Um, no, no communication as such in that regard. And do you know what? I think the way I was playing at the time, I'm, I wasn't surprised. Um, like I said, it had knocked me for six. I mean, if they had called, <laughs> I would have been there in a flash. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be worried about that. But, uh, yeah, no, no, it never materialised. And, uh, yeah, uh, would have been nice to have got the call. But, um, yeah, no, no, that wasn't ever a, a possibility. We had a tweet from the Ang car who said, your best and your worst moments on the pitch for Orient. Oh, God, best. That's a lot of bests. Oof. You can give us a selection of best. I mean, there are obviously loads yeah, of moments. I, I think, I, think uh, I mean, it's... Uh, wasn't the best of goals, but my first goal was, I'll always remember that, bending in and, you know, trying to earn the respect from my teammates. You know, the manager that had, had brought me in, obviously I'd worked with Russ before, but obviously this is coming to a different club and, and obviously the fan base, you know, but I've come in and uh, I just left Brighton and it was, it's me trying to, show them what I can do as well. So that first goal sort of set the tone, really. Um, but obviously the piece for a moment, huge. Um, drawing against Arsenal. Um, you know, I, I, there's no, I don't hide it. I love scoring goals and, and assisting, you know. Uh, Any time I scored it, that, that's a big moment for me, <laughs> to be honest. You know, scoring for Lane Oil was was such an incredible feeling. Um, and that's probably one of the things I miss most is that roar when uh, you put the ball in the back of the net, you know, running off. And, you know, it's such a tight-knit, it is such a tight-knit group of fans and seeing people, you know, I, I, I could name them, the people in the crowd. 
you know, that they have such a good bond at the, the 2014-15. And, yeah, it was... I miss that. If you could give me that one more time, I, I'd pay good money for that. <laughs> <laughs> Failed stuntman tweeted and said, when the O's game at Forest Green was called off, how did you feel about a coachload of Orient fans turning up to cheer you on when you were at Eastbourne Borough? Do you know what? That was absolutely incredible. And I mean incredible. It was a rainy day. Obviously, we were on 3G, so obviously the game was on. And uh, I remember uh, getting changed and uh, I looked at my phone and, and saw a tweet saying, oh yeah, we're heading down and on for no, they're surely they're not, not in this weather and all that way. And uh, yeah, I should go out to warm up and sing in my songs that they were singing at Orient. Yeah. It, it, was, <laughs> it was absolutely surreal. It really was. It was uh, an incredible feeling. And just, you know, I'd obviously left the club for, for a few years and, and to still have that sort of bonds. I mean, they stayed after the game, had a drink with them. You know, they, they weren't rushing home. Um, I remember walking into the bar and they started singing my songs in there. It, it, it was incredible. And just, you know, I remember my wife and the kids would sort of, oh my God. And it was just one of them that was just like, that's, that's why I had such a good bond with them, just the support. You know, like, like you said, the, the game was called off and they could have all gone home. Could have gone and, you know, and I wouldn't blame them. But to actually get on a coach and tell them to come down to Eastbourne, it, it, sorry, I'll never forget. It was, it was brilliant. Dean, you mentioned your songs. Did you ever, obviously there are a few songs that I can recall from your time at Orient. Was there a favourite one that kind of got your blood pumping harder, harder than the other ones you would hear? Um, I, 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 I like it's magic, you know, after I yeah, saw... Yeah, that's one in my head. Yeah, same. You know what, as well, I, I mean, it's out, I shouldn't really say it, but it, when, when, when the, you guys are singing it, I'm singing it as well. I'm, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm singing along to it. I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. I used to come home, I used to see it to the kids and my... Get the Alexa on. Oh, Alexa. Yeah, that was just like, shout out. I was like, he's magic, you know. I was like, yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I, I did like that one. And I, I, used to, I used to sing it a lot on the training ground. Russ used to go mad. You know, whenever <laughs> he was dissecting a game and it, it, I obviously wouldn't do it during it and it finished and I'd start singing and then he's like, oh, here he goes again. And, but yeah, it's just brilliant. And then some of the lads even like, if I scored in training, they'd start singing it. And yeah, that one really stuck. Um, but I used to love it. I mean, I don't know if they ever got caught on camera, but I, I, I definitely... Near enough every time we'd, we'd, we'd sort of sing it with you. It was brilliant. <laughs> we had a few uh, questions on the forum as well. So we had one from Thor who said, You are an Orient legend, which we all know anyway. He says, My question is, where do you see your future in the game? So I think you mentioned it at the top of the interview, but looking to get back into, into football management. Yeah, I, I think at any capacity, you know, I'm, I'm not just saying I want to be a manager, you know, coach, academy coach. Yeah, obviously my passion's football, and um, I think at the moment I'm just in a, in a place where I'm sort of trying to earn strikes and get game experience, um, and, and sort of try and work my way up. You know, I think that you've obviously got to start somewhere, and you know I'm, I'm I'm very early into my journey, and that's why I hope it can happen. If it doesn't, then then it doesn't. But I certainly want to give it a good go. Buffalo Bill said, did you ever have offers to play in the championship? And if so, why didn't you take them up? Yeah, I did have offers, yeah. Peace the breath. Uh, why didn't I go? Uh, I mean, it's well documented. They come in a few times, yeah. uh, even when they're in League One. And I couldn't get very far off the phone. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he is a character. He, 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 he was great, but, I mean, he's so persistent. You can see why he gets deals done. Um, why didn't I go? I mean, I said, uh, the, the main reason, uh, when they come on really, really strong, I mean, listen, um, Barry accepted a bid um, for 500 grand. And... Uh, 
I remember Russ ringing me and saying, look, I, haven't, I don't want you to go, but Barry has accepted. I got wind of it, don't get me wrong, my agent was sort of saying, I think they're going to bid for you, uh, just to let you know. And uh, I said, well, I don't want to go. <laughs> you know, that, that's my... Th- it's so hard, you know, people... To put a reason why, I, I just loved where I was, if mm-hmm. I'm being honest. I, I, uh, uh, it, it, listen, more money? Yeah, it was. You know, it, of course it was. But I don't think there's... You can't put a price on happiness for that. You know, I was happy. I was... I was able to travel to and from home. My home life was, was stable. I, I said it just, and, and plus I was I was playing well, and you know we just got to the League One playoff final. I mean I'm talking about the first the 500 grand bid was, I think it was two years before that, and then pretty much guys from every window then on. Um, Certainly three bids, but obviously because I turned them down a couple of times, that they 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 had an officially bid, but Barry was ringing me up and trying to sell me. And I mean, he he was the character; he really was. But um, yeah, just I was happy where I was, um, and I was hoping, obviously, to get to the championship with 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 Leighton Orient. You know, we were slowly getting better throughout the years that I was there. And then obviously we got so close. Um, so yeah, I was happy. You know, it's, like I said, more money. Obviously it's the championship, but mm. like I said, I don't think you can put a price on happiness and, and playing regular football. Would I play every week? I don't know. And, you know, one thing I did do when I was at Leicester, I played a lot of games and I was used to that and I enjoyed that. And I didn't feel going there being a, a bit of part player. Did I back myself? Yeah, of course. I did back myself, but obviously knew that there was a possibility of, of of perhaps not playing half, you know, probably half the amount of games. But I was happy. I was playing every week. I was playing well. I just loved where I was. So I think that's the answer to that. We had a kind of similar question around moving from Owsbury O's, who said, I believe, Dean, you you can't drive or didn't when you were playing. Do you think this hindered your career and restrict the number of clubs you could play for? Still don't drive. No interest. <laughs> got no interest. I've got a bus stop outside my house. So I'll be soon getting my OAP card. I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Do I think it hindered me? Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I don't really know. I... I'm a very homey guy. You know, I had plenty of office throughout my career up north. That did not interest me. I just, yeah, I sort of set that out quite early. So, um, I think my missus would like me to drive so I can help her out with dispatching the kids here, there and everywhere. Yeah. I think that's the biggest of people I've got. But, um, yeah, I don't think so. I think, you know, when I first moved to Leighton, I, I moved down there, Newby Park. Um, then I went to South Woodford. Um, and it was by fluke that I had to get out of the flat for but there was something wrong with my boiler or something. And I couldn't stay there anyway. And uh, I just commuted home after training. I was thinking, this ain't that bad. You know, on the train, it took me about an hour and a half. I was like, you know what? I fancy a bit of this, so obviously I left South Woodford and just moved back home. And uh, yeah, I've obviously done it ever since. But, uh, no, I don't think so. I, I had no interest in going up north. I wasn't, um, you know, the likes of Scunthorpe, Coventry, Bristol Rovers, Yeovil, uh, you know, those sort of teams that, that sort of showed interest throughout my career. It, I remember my agent ringing me up. I know you're not interested, but it's my job to tell you. So and so's interested. I take it as a no, and I always go, yeah. <laughs> tell them no. Just tell them no. I'm not interested. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think so, because I, I didn't have much interest about going up north. I was quite, I like home comforts. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the answer. 
Maybe, maybe not, but I don't think so. <laughs> Fair. We had a question come in on Facebook from Dave Danu who said, who were your footballing idols growing up and did you base your game on any of them? Uh, I think everyone. I mean, for me, it was always David Beckham and crossing and I mean, I never got to... Uh, yeah, I don't think I could ever cross a ball like him, but I, I certainly, especially at Orient, a crossing was, was big. And I think, you know, crossing... When we had strikers like Kevin Lisby, good headers of the ball, um, it was always important. So we'd always do extra. Um, you know, my game was, you know, we had obviously Mo, Moses Idabaji on the, the other side. He was more pace and see you later, skinning people. And I slowly thought, well, I've got to have a bit of a more string to my bow. And I was always a good pass to the ball and, and, and whatnot. And, score goals but I felt that you know crossing is is just sometimes of course you're on the run when you're crossing but if it's dead balls or you're chopping back and I think that that, that can really be practised you know I could never get any quicker as much as I tried <laughs> I never got any quicker but yeah I think that would be someone that definitely you know the, the way you could just manipulate and get half a yard and whip in across and uh, I think slowly in time when I was at Orient, you know, my assists sort of record got higher and higher due to just practice. But also, you know, I've got to say, we, we, we had some top strikers that would would sometimes make an a, a OK cross look like a great cross. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, Dean, you've answered loads of questions and, and given us a real insightful view uh, into your time at the O's I guess to wrap this one up then what's your I guess closing message uh, to the Orient fans uh, yeah difficult I think uh, it would have been nice to have had a, a proper goodbye really I think uh, just a massive thank you for everything and I mean everything uh, the support the love cheering sticking by me you know the, the biggest biggest moment was when I obviously had my injury and you know, sticking by me when I when I couldn't kick a ball for eight months and still getting the same love. I think that just shows uh, top class people, and you know, I can't, I can, well, I can never, never repay them enough for for everything. But that that time was 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 a big one for me, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just sorry it ended the way it did. It wasn't the way I envisaged it, um, but I'll always hold the club in such a high regard. You know, it hasn't scarred any of that. Um, fantastic football club and yeah the, the best fans that, that I ever had in my career so thanks very much I'll be sure to come down sometime this season to see you but um, stick by the team and uh, onwards and upwards and forwards I think the fact I think you know from our perspective I think the fact that we last had you on in 2015 and when you kind of tweeted you were ready to kind of tell your story and there was still such a demand to hear from you I think the fact that the fans still um, hold you in such high regard is a massive testament to your career at Leighton Orient Dean so I think for myself and Paul and probably the entire Orient fan base a massive thank you um, for your time at Leighton Orient and your passion showed on the pitch and we could tell that you wore the shirt with, with pride which is more than could be said for some people Different circumstances, maybe, but it, it's definitely something that um, you know you'll always, you'll never pay for a drink at Leighton Orient. That's uh, <laughs> that that's yeah, no, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> Although saying that, Dean, I remember getting into the uh, Starman Awards <laughs> one year, and as soon as you saw us, you got the Jaeger bombs in straight away. So uh, a, belated, <laughs> a belated thank you for the Jaeger at Starman yeah, at need, some point. We, we need another one soon. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, Dean. Thank you very much thank indeed. Right. For joining us thanks for choosing us to tell your your story we really appreciate it and we wish you and the family all the very best for the future so that is it thanks very much to dean for for um for being on on the podcast again if you're listening on itunes please subscribe give the podcast a five star rate and we'd be very much appreciative of that if you're listening on spotify don't forget to rate the show you can even leave a comment on each episode so if you do get a chance please do so we'd be very grateful and don't forget to follow us or add us to your favourites or your chosen podcast providers. That way 
You'll get all the episodes as soon as they're available. We're also on Smart Speakers, the Fan Hub app, and we're also on YouTube, so listening to the podcast has never been easier. Likewise, if you've got an older relative, a loved one, a friend who's got a passing interest in Orient, who you think they'll enjoy it, uh, keeping up to date with everything late in Orient, grab their phone for them and download and pass the pod. Yeah, so a massive thank you once again to Dean Cox. So we'll be back with episode 363 next week with all the information and views that you could ever need. We look forward to hearing from you. And as always, keep calm, stay safe, have a great week and listen to the Orient Outlook podcast.